Yeah, so uh, hello, welcome to this talk that I've uh, constructed, I guess. Um, yeah, so I'm Simon, and I'm here to hold a talk about uh, the previous slide, which is uh, Deep Convolutional Neural Networks for Image Scaling. Um, so what we hope to get through today is, who am I, hopefully, uh, so what is DCNN scaling? Um, how do we do it practically? How does it work underneath? Like how, on, this is a beginner's talk, right? So we're not gonna go deep into exactly the maths and stuff, but we are gonna talk about the ideas and the, the concepts around it. Um, we are gonna talk about why we want to use it and why we would maybe not want to use it all the time and when it's appropriate. So I guess those two last ones kind of overlap, but we'll get to it. So this is me. Uh, I worked in uh, no experience, uh, no experience Bergen since uh, last summer. Uh, started as a uh, uh, like summer intern and then basically continued. Uh, I worked mainly with Umbraco and I'm part of the creative crew here uh, in Bergen. So, yeah, uh, we also, uh, yeah, I studied at the uh, University of Bergen, Cognitive Science, for uh, two and a half years. Uh, and I'm not affiliated with any of this software or programs that we're about to see. Uh, I'm just casually interested in, uh, in uh, machine learning. And also, it applies somewhat to my uh, education with it being focused a little bit around the uh, AI. So what's going on with deep convolutional neural, <coughs> neural networks? So the deep part uh, is basically that it's a process that goes through many iterations. So it's not just a single process that runs. It's like we do this process and then we do another process and then we do the first process again and we do another process. So it's multiple layers and it can be arbitrarily deep. And depending on what you want to use it for, it varies. Uh, the convolutional is the math part, uh, but it basically boils down to uh, a way of combining functions so you simplify. At least that's my understanding. Uh, yeah. And the neural part is obviously that this entire, entire field is uh, inspired by how the human brains work, or brains in general, uh, with that everything is uh, based on not neurons, but individual processes that do very simple tasks on their own, but combined they can do very complex things. And uh, in that we don't always know how they work, only that they kind of work, usually. And the network part should be fairly obvious, like it's a network of these neurons. So. The main focus on this talk is going to be around a, a program called Waifu 2x, which I managed to do wrong in my uh, in the tags for this talk, where I write, wrote uh, Waifu x2. But so the origins of this should be pretty obvious, like why somebody sat down to start to do this. It was uh, based around trying to basically if you have a low res image and you can't find the original or maybe it was drawn that way 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, but you want it on your beautiful 4K display and you don't want it to look all blurry or blocky uh, like you would usually get if you just upscaled it in Photoshop or GIMP or whatever. Uh, yes. So good news, if somebody wants to try this, there is uh, the guy who made this. Uh, put up a nice site with just a demo project where you can upload a file, just tell it if it's a photo or, uh, or an artwork, and set it to how much moisture reduction you want to do and what kind of upscaling you want to do. And you got to confirm that you're human because there is a, well, we'll get back to that, but there is a, a quite a serious uh, resource drain on running these things. So, yeah, the downside here, of course, sorry, I had notes for this. So this is easy, obviously, this 
takes two minutes to do, and there is no understanding of the underlying stuff needed. Like everything here is pretty obvious. Uh, it's super fast, you just go there. Uh, there is no significant hardware. Obviously, you need a phone or some sort of browser. But it's kind of slow. When it's uh, you have fewer options. Like if you have it locally, you don't. You're not limited to two x. You could go hundred x if you hate your computer. Uh, also, it probably won't get you anything good, <laughs> but you can. Uh, it doesn't upscale. Like if you want to do a hundred images or a thousand images. Uh, this will be hell for you, and it will probably also block you at some point. Uh, yeah, and the quality is not, at least if I remember correctly, the quality is not as good as you get with a local one. It takes a few shortcuts. Uh, it's a demo project, right? It's just, it's, it's cool to see what it can do, but it's not that interesting to play around with. Uh, yes, so on Windows, you basically uh, have, uh, I'm going to go back to this, but basically they have you, you have the NVIDIA tools in the bottom, and then you have a cafe, which we'll also get back to, and then you have the program in the bottom. So installing it is not as easy. You, you, just, you don't just go online and download this program. you got to do some preparation. So preferably, this is not mandatory, but it will speed up the process by a factor of uh, well, it's exponentially faster to use a GPU than a CPU. So you wanna, you wanna, for Windows, you wanna NVIDIA at least uh, with uh, as many CUDA cores as you can possibly muster. So preferably at least from the thousand generation, like GTX 10, whatever, or up. Um, yes, you want. This was a problem on my computer. Uh, I thought I had everything good, but then it turns out that the driver for the graphics card was wrong. They, they worked fine, but not with this. <laughs> uh, you need the uh, NVIDIA CUDA tools, which basically enable you to do anything other than uh, what they originally did. This is all official software, by the way. It's just not user or consumer based. And then you need uh, Waifu, obviously, 2X and Cafe. Um, yes. So when you, once you do get it started, this is the kind of interface that meets you. It's still pretty simple. It's not, there is not too much. So up here, the top part here is basically just uh, normal file settings like you'll find in Photoshop or whatever. The, the kind of uh, extension you want, how many color bits you want out, uh, and what where to save the file and where to get it from. Uh, and down here we have uh, uh, what kind of uh, filters you want to run on it. So you can either, you can denoise and magnify. So you can just both make it bigger and you can remove noise. Um, and depending on what kind of image you're dealing with, you want one or the other or both. Um, yes. So the den, uh, I had this thing. Uh, the denoise level is how much it reduces noise, and it also makes the picture more like uh, blurry, or like it, it can uh, you get uh, gradients between colors. So again, depends on your image. Magnification rate is pretty self-explanatory. This increases the size by two or four if you want. Uh, uh, this is the model. This, uh, this uh, entire system is a learning network. We'll get back to that as well. But it basically means that what kind of image you're trying to do, it, it treats photographs differently than it would treat uh, an artwork. And there are many different kinds of artworks. So you can, not with this software, but you can potentially uh, train it yourself if you don't get the GUI version of this and you have Linux. Uh, yes, and then you have the some optimization for the how the GPU runs this. And I don't understand this part entirely. And if you put this number here too high, you get stuff like that instead of the image that you want. It could be a bug with the graphics driver. I don't know, but it, it didn't like that. 
So in the settings for this thing, uh, this is an important setting because even though even if you have a CUDA cord, this is not enabled by default. It will just run on your CPU, which will take a long time. Uh, also, this seems a little bit low resolution, so we'll upscale that with uh, Waifu X2. You probably can't see it; it's not on the on the projector. But anyway, so on when I upscaled this image, it took 13 seconds on the GPU, but with the CPU, it would take three minutes, 56 seconds. And this only gets worse. Like this was just doubling the resolution. And it's what, like 400 by 600 maybe. Uh, so if you had, if you wanted to increase by four and you had higher quality maybe, then it would take a lot longer. So you definitely want GPU. So here, we looked at this before, but basically, so you have Waifu at X at the top, and then you have Cafe, and then you have the NVIDIA tools. Uh, so of course, we're gonna start at the bottom to look at this. And to look at this, we need to talk a little bit of how this even works. So probably, I don't know how many of you are developers, but every, basically everyone in the world has heard about AI. So AI is a general term for everything that is, that tries to mimic human or has mimics intelligence, does things without being explicitly told exactly what to do. So it, this could be as simple as recognizing faces or it could be uh, in a, like a chess game, you can explicitly program this. You can say that for, you can, def, you can set up in tic-tac-toe for example, you can basically set up every single possible combination of that game and tell the computer exactly what move it should do. Just like, it will always do that move if this board looks like this. There's nothing smart about it, but it's still AI because it behaves uh, in an intelligent way. Uh, underneath there we have machine learning, which is a subset of that. Uh, it goes into the kind of stuff where instead of telling the computer exactly how to deal with every single possible thing that you throw at it, you give it some input. There are many ways to do this, but one of the ways is to, uh, to show it uh, a lot of data, a lot of, for example, Google does this with uh, their, um, well, there are you human things. It's like, oh, please tell me where all the traffic lights are and you tell it, that's Google teaching their self-driving cars, of course, uh, what traffic lights look like. And some of the images that comes up there is a little bit concerning. Uh, deep learning is the kind of learning where you, uh, where you have a little bit of a, like you have the multiple level thing. Uh, and the deep convolutional neural networks is, is where you have the multiple levels, but you also have the abstraction between each layers. So here is an example of a learning machine that I stole from Wikipedia. Um, so it's for, for these kind of uh, learning machines, you have partial, like you teach it, you basically teach it, here are the things that you will, the kind of things that you'll expect to see, like an image of an elephant, a kangaroo, and a penguin. And then you tell it the answers, and you just give it a lot of these images, and you'll give it thousands and thousands of images, like thousands of elephants, and just like, this is an elephant, and thousands of kangaroo, and this is a kangaroo. And then the computer gets to try and find some sort of function that correlates that. It'll just try random things, and it will, tr for deep convolutional neural networks, it will try it for every layer. So we'll go like, okay, I see some lines here, and if I kind of combine those lines, we get these kind of shapes, and if we combine these shapes, we get a vaguely shaped thing, and if we combine those, we get an elephant, and that's an elephant. And of course, you can go beyond this. You can go teach it what does a standing elephant look like or an angry elephant, but it will take exponentially more uh, teaching material for it, for it to understand what you want. Like, and it will never be perfect. It will always come up with like, uh, you'll give it a bowling ball and it says, ah, it's a penguin, because it's black and vaguely round shapes. 
So we're in GPUs. So they're very fast, which is why, or not only why, but that's one of the reasons we use them. They have very low latency because they need to render stuff now. Uh, they have many, many cores, which means that we can render many things at the same time. Uh, they have a limited instruction set, but that, that's, in some cases, that's very useful. It mainly, mainly goes into these two points here. Because they have a limited instruction set, we can make very many of them, and they can be fast, uh, which makes them excellent at multi-threading. But they're not only good at making fancy games or cool graphics scenes. Uh, they can be good at anything as long as you write the instructions for them right. And that's the beautiful thing about neural networks is that oftentimes we can write these functions to, to work on these tiny cores. So you can run thousands of these instructions at the same time in parallel, and you can run thousands or millions of them every second. So that, that's basically where the power of these things come from. So if we could even run even more, then we have even more power. But again, this is an exponential issue, so you got to have exponentially more cores to get more performance. Yes. So while we're on the subject, when I put that image that we saw earlier into uh, for, uh, PowerPoint, it informed me that it was a computer sitting on the table. And that is not metadata because I took that picture. So there's something there. Or it could possibly be my phone that tagged it. But something there tagged it. So, yes. Uh, we talked about the NVIDIA tools, and they have basically, uh, yeah, they have two kinds. They have the general tools that we talked about, and then they have the specific ones here, a framework uh, for, um, oh, sorry, a library, a library for um, deep convolutional linear networks. So they've basically enabled this kind of um, development. So there are many kind of, uh, well, you can download this for free, by the way. Uh, there are many kind of uh, uh, frameworks that work on this. CAFE, which is what this project is using. Uh, Chainer, Keras, uh, MATLAB, MXNet, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Uh, I've only really ever touched uh, TensorFlow and CAFE, but the point is that it's widely supported. Uh, yes. Of time. I talk too fast. Uh, yes. So the second layer here is CAFE, which is the, the framework that the, that YFOX2 works on. Uh, it's also open source. Well, NVIDIA is not open source, but CAFE and YFU is. Um, it works basically as an intermediary between uh, uh, between the NVIDIA stuff and the uh, and the program. So yeah, it was made by University of uh, California, Berkeley, and it's open source, as I mentioned. Uh, YFU 2X, which is the interesting part here, or one of the interesting things. Uh, yes, it's an uh, application layer, that's not right. Yeah, built, yeah, it's built for scaling images. Uh, that's the primary thing, it's open source. Uh, it has no GUI by default, which is, we'll get back to. Uh, it's made for Linux, originally, and other things are built on top of it. So that's an, also an important thing to notice, that note that uh, CAFE is not required on Linux. Uh, you can run, no, sorry, yeah, you can run Waifu directly on uh, on Linux machine. You don't need an intermediary layer. So that's where this project comes in. It's basically taking that application and they've made their own GitHub project for making it work on Windows. Uh, you also have a GUI project for Linux, which is this one, Qt GUI. And then you have other projects like this one that has made it into a video upscaler, which is also very interesting. Uh, I don't think my computer can do that, though. So the advantages here uh, are, is that it's extremely flexible. Like, you can, you can teach it to write, no, oh, sorry, to treat almost any kind of uh, images. It's like, it's like upscaling of them, obviously. But you can, you can teach it to do 
almost any kind of images. Uh, you can, if it doesn't do the particular thing that you want it to do, you can teach it how to do it. Uh, it's open source, which I always appreciate. And it's free, which I also appreciate. Uh, that doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, it's power intensive, like it takes a lot of GPU or and or CPU to run. Uh, it can have some unpredictable effects, especially, like, especially if you're not used to it, you can end up with some pretty wacky results like the image I showed earlier. Uh, you need specialized hardware. In this case, it's an NVIDIA GPU, but that's, I think, only for the Windows version. Uh, yes, and the training data can be very use case specific. Like, there's hard to make a general upscaling because there's a huge difference between a simple logo and a picture of a bustling town and a bus and a bacteria. So it's all very different. So you need to teach it or and have different models for every specific use case you wanted to do. Speaking of use cases. So this is just off the top of my head though. Like obviously the things that is best at is low resolution stuff like drawings and low resolution logos, for example, on a website. And for example, you have a, uh, a customer that's like, hey, I have this logo on a website, I want it bigger. And he asked, like, do you have a source file? It's like, no. Okay, I guess that's my 35 by 35 image I have to work with. Um, yes, so basically quick things where you don't have, you don't really have the budget and you don't have uh, the options to redo the whole thing. Uh, yes, low resolution video, uh, especially animated, it's pretty good at that. And a lot of shows, in many cases, uh, the original footage may be lost or the original footage may actually be in standard definition, which is not so fun when you try to make your very cool uh, Blu-ray re-release of whatever show. So it could be very useful for that because redoing it is obviously not an option. Uh, photography, uh, there is really no other better way to upscale photography than deep neural network. Uh, it can create some wacky results, but it, for the most part, you don't really, there's nothing else that's better than it. Uh, and then waifus, obviously, because that's what it was made for. And then probably many other examples that I can't think of. Uh, many neural networks actually react quite nicely to things that aren't graphics at all, or that at least that are not in the domain that they were taught. So hypothetically, if you taught it how to, you give it a bunch of music files in low bit rates, and you show it how those music files would look with a high bit rate, maybe it could good, be good at chip tunes, up making those higher bit rates. But again, like the, the point is you can teach it lots of things and you might get varying results, but there could be out of scope use cases here. Uh, don't use cases. So obviously product, like if you have a production level thing and it's like, and you, you have an artist that gave you an, a logo in PNG that's a little bit low resolution, obviously the solution is not to throw it into waifu x2 and 2x and make it bigger, you ask the artist, can you please export it in high resolution or in, in a vector based, based format. Photography, sometimes it doesn't work with photography at all. Like you have to, <laughs> sometimes it could be better just to upscale it in, in Photoshop. But obviously Photoshop can't make magic detail that's not usually visible. Uh, if the image is too small, uh, everything falls apart. It just creates details that it maybe thinks is there, but it's actually just like two pixels that are next to each other. Uh, and I don't think it would be very viable for a stream and any sort of streaming kind of thing. Like if you, obviously I'm not thinking like YouTube, but obviously that as well, but more like, uh, it w I wouldn't use it as an intermediary layer between a website that requests images and then the user was, so I'll just get high, high resolution images for the user <laughs> just straight from the disk. Uh, it takes too long, basically. So if you want, if you need the data now, you need to find something else. Uh, yes, alternatives, 
I could only really find one other uh, reasonably si like reasonably popular uh, image upscaler that's an AI, and that's that one. It's uh, not in the scope of my talk, but I think it's paid. Uh, then you have the normal scaling that in Photoshop, but for the most part, this basically decides how much blurring, like how much, would you rather have blur or would you have straight blocky lines is what you get to decide here for the most part. And then you have uh, stuff like Illustrator. It does some, uh, it has uh, some automatic uh, vector tracing. Uh, it can be good, especially for logos, and it might outperform this stuff for logos if there are clear lines. Uh, yes, and remaking the assets, obviously. That's kind of a side point. So some examples, which I should probably put earlier in the talk, but I, it was too late. So here's an original image. Well, well the original image was over 2,000 pic pixels, but it's downscaled to 500, basically. And then I downscaled that again to 246. So this is a, something that you might expect to see on a website as a logo. So I zoomed in a little bit so you can see the original, and this is half the resolution. So this is how Photoshop, with the preferred option that Photoshop chooses for you, which is preferred detail, this is what it does. You can kind of, it kind of breaks with the uh, projector, but you, there you can see like this is blurry corner, and you get some uh, uh, color banding here, uh, and it, it's generally blurry. If it was me, I would use just use nearest neighbor, but that's basically not upscaling at all anyway. And this is with Wi-Fi 2x. Uh, and zoomed in. I legitimately thought I put the wrong file in here because it looked exactly like this is what it had to work with. But this is the original, and I thought it just duplicated it, and I made a mistake. But it actually does, it's amazing how good of a job it does, I think. I can, I can barely tell the difference. Uh, there's some, there is a slight gradient here that's lost because it figures that was just noise. Uh, that could maybe that could be fixed if I used a different setting, but this is what Photoshop does, and it's it's uh, I think it's very blurry at least, and this is what I had to work with. Uh, a little bit more of an extreme example, the same thing down to 100 pixels. Uh, this is what it looks like now. There's not much left, <laughs> uh, and. None of these are very good solutions, but I think this one is still better. Um, you can see it, it does a lot better job than Photoshop, at least, with, which is just a blurry mess at this point. This at least has, it has some issues with the corners because it thinks this may be part of the same object. Uh, that's the original again. It transforms that into that. And this is uh, what it should look like. This is basically the original at this size. Uh, yes, so I did the same thing for the giant picture, full-sized. There's no point in showing the whole thing because obviously the resolution is too low. Um, and I halved it to the 500 pixel one again. And uh, it did a pretty good job, unlike Photoshop again, which does this weird color banding. Uh, that's what it had to work with. That's the original. And obviously it's not as straight, uh, which is probably where a... Uh, a vector-based thing might be better. Uh, a practical example, we had some GIF in one of our applications that we did for Pilocoft. And this is basically just an, just an internal test of what it would look like if we just ran it through here. And it's uh, significantly better. This is the original, or what we had to work with, at least. So it did, uh, did an impressive job on the hand. Yeah, just short on photography. It's not as good at photography. Uh, it does a pretty good, it does a decent job. So this is what happens if you, sorry, there we go. Yeah, that's the original image. And this is what it is downscaled. So it's pretty close. It's not perfectly there, but it's done a decent job, I think. 
yeah, that's mostly my talk. And some uh, resources here, and the talk if you want it. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, there's no, uh, I don't think it would have an issue with that. We could try. Do you have a, a nice example image that we can? Not really, but uh, this Christmas I saw It's a Wonderful Life, this old movie from the 40s, but it was in color. Hmm. And I wondered what technology they would use, but probably something like this, right? Yeah. All right.